Well, I didn't intend to, to make a question, but I, I have one. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, you said that you ju just study the effect of non-alcohol beer, but alcohol in itself, may, it may also have a positive effect. For instance, it blocks, or I mean it blocks, it, it, it links the GABA receptors, and as a consequence, it may have a it's a tranquilizing effect, or, or like benzodiazepines and so on. So it, it may add a positive effect to the effect in terms of relaxa uh, relaxation, um, 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 psychological adaptation, and coping with the stress, finally, coping with the stress, and those individuals are highly stressed. Uh, that could be, this effect, particular effect of, al of alcohol, could be of interest. Uh, I mean, you absolutely abandon the idea of testing the effect of alcohol beer, not in a light sport men, but in just um, common people who run, say, perhaps not even a marathon, but, but uh, a strenuous exercise. Yeah, this would be a good idea, but uh, we excluded the alcohol because running a marathon with alcohol would be pretty difficult because we offered them also during the marathon race, every five Ks, we offered them the non-alcoholic beer and they had to drink it if they want or not, so uh, that they also get the polyphenols during the race and this was very important. And therefore I don't think that uh, alcoholic beer would be so successful because after that the dropout rate during the marathon race would increase rapidly. After the first 10 kilometers we had a lot of runners uh, just at the side of the street and no one would come to the finish line and uh, we also um, discussed whether we were going to take non-alcoholic red wine but uh, actually we know that there are two companies producing non-alcoholic red wine but the taste was so awkward that uh, I think it wasn't successful and uh, perhaps we might have also but a study running with alcoholic beer. Yeah. But do you know that some marathon runners drink a little bit of beer, just a, a, a little amount, several uh, milliliters during the race. Did you know that? <laughs> I, uh, I, do you know the Medoc Marathon? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I know, uh, I know. I'm, 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 I'm people who are very much stressed. I mean, the problem with the, with the stressful exercise is coping with yeah. the stress. Yeah. And I a very little amount. I mean, several milliliters and so on, like a kind of tranquilizing effect, do you know that? Yeah, this might be also interesting because we know that uh, during the marathon there's a steep increase also in the catecholamines and also cortisol. So the physical and also the psychological stress is increased. So this might be also a beneficial effect. If I might, may, uh, may I ask a question? Oh, of course. Well, is the Berum thing good? Pardon? Is this Berum thing as good as a beer? I think so, yeah. Yes? <laughs> yeah, I, I do, it goes great because... <laughs> Formerly it was a beer, yeah. and, uh, so but, but, but it was, uh, uh, the gas in it was reduced from uh, 30, uh, 40 grams to, uh, per liter to 10 grams, so it was a little bit boring to drink it, but uh, we had to do it because running with a lot of gas in the beverage so, yeah. wouldn't be possible. Yeah, and I would like you to consider the fact that troponin uh, high sensitivity troponin is measuring a skeletal muscle uh, uh, damage, <laughs> not heart damage. And this is something that we have seen now because many patients were coming with high sensitivity troponin yeah. measurements and they didn't have myocardial infarction. So I think it's, and it, it's compatible with the fact that the marathon runners are really exercising the, the skeletal muscles. Yeah, but w we also examined FABP yes. and heart specific FABP. Yes. And there was a similar effect. I didn't show the data, but it was similar to the effect. Yeah, so this is uh, so this is heart specific, the uh, FABP, and therefore I think it's also effect on the heart. So yeah. So this is high risky business then <laughs> to run a marathon. <laughs> yeah, it, it is high risky business because we had a 32 old uh, marathon runner having an acute myocardial infarction during the race. Yeah. So. My daughter runs marathons, you know, <laughs> so I have to <laughs> talk. <laughs> uh, is there any question? I would like, uh, excuse me. Uh, 
excellent lecture. Do you have a much more precise idea about the, the product uh, into your non-alcoholic beer is able to produce a nitric oxide uh, difference in production? You know, which compound you, yes. you ask? Yes. No. Because what we have um, analyzed is uh, beer that is in the supermarket. Our idea was to investigate beer that was accessible to users. This was the first study we have done. So we used lager beer, uh, commercially available in Spain, and it was with alcohol, and then a, a beer from the same group without alcohol. And that's the only thing we have tested. What I said is that maybe because we have found so beneficial effects, now it's interesting to understand, to follow and understand which is the compound that is producing the effect. More than anything is, I believe we should have beer. I mean, I'm sorry for Berum and all these things, but no, no, it's a, it's a joke, huh? <laughs> but, but the point is that what beer has is a palatable drink, and we should not forget that, because in a way we like to have um, a diet that is a composition of palatable ingredients or nutritional mm, foods, that like the Mediterranean diet is palatable. And I think to, in, to incorporate beer in the Mediterranean diet will be a, a good asset because I think it belongs there. Beer was born in Mesopotamia, right, in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I, I, we forgot about that. So in a way, I think that that's why we wanted to start investigating the whole compound. And afterwards, I mean, I have a Rosa there in Barcelona, so we have the possibility of investigating single ingredients. But I'm not so keen because um, well maybe we should do it because as I learned very much this morning, you know, because I'm not a beer person. I'm a newcomer in beer. <laughs> so in a way, I learned because obviously there are many types of beer, many, and in the future, it was presented to us in the first, uh, in the second talk after you this morning. So we were um, taught that maybe there are many different changes in ingredients that would produce different uh, products, final products. And I think our uh, challenge in the future is to identify that all these different beers have the same beneficial effects. That by now we cannot say it. Mm -hmm. So your question is well taken. I think we should pursue that. Yeah. Yeah. Carmen, can I have mm -hmm. another question? Do you have seen another question? So uh, the, the do you have some, some data after having a stroke? Do you always observe the protective effect of very small dose of alcohol? Can you repeat? Uh, After having a stroke. Um, we have uh, several meta-analyses uh, on alcohol and stroke, uh, and we found the protective effect of ischemic stroke uh, and not uh, hemorrhagic stroke over low moderate alcohol consumption. And um, we have uh, the famous uh, meta-analysis of Reynolds, uh, and uh, last year was published another meta-analysis of stroke and alcohol consumption. Uh, study on beer and stroke, the relevant study on beer and stroke uh, in the previous meta-analysis on wine, um, find some, some only two studies on wine and, and stroke, but on beer no, no study at the moment. Dr. Rahman, I have another question. Of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> For the man in the middle. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you're shaped like a cyclist. Uh, and you know, in, in, in the cycling field, what is very, uh, and it's very specific to the biking people, after having a long biking uh, journey, it's so good to have a beer. And it's very specific to, 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 to the biking people. So for, for do you feel it's, it's very specific? I, I don't know why, but maybe you have an explanation of that. You know, one thing is that beer is isotonic normally, so it's uh, also promoted as a perfect sports drink. And uh, perhaps sometimes you have a little bit uh, to have a look at the electrolytes, if they are also, because if you sweat, you lose a lot of uh, sodium. And uh, so you have to take the sodium perhaps in an extra dose of salt. And because it's sometimes it's pretty low within the beer, it depends on the water of uh, the ingredients. but. This might be one effect that there's also a lot of uh, carbohydrates in it, not only the small ones like glucose or fructose, but also the maltodextrin. It's also a uh, carbohydrate, so it's also for the uh, recovery of the, your storages. So this might be also beneficial.
congratulations because all the field talks have been very interesting. Well, I have two questions. One for Gina and the other for you. Is there a difference between, for example, there is any difference in epidemiological data? I don't think so. Between beer with alcohol or beer without ethanol, or between, for example, is another question: white wine or red wine? There is data or that? Yes, and uh, I haven't studied. Uh, I haven't performed meta-analysis on beer without or with alcohol. And uh, the instead, uh, data on uh, red and white wine is a very, uh, there is a very small number of this data. So it's very difficult to perform meta-analysis when we have uh, a so low number of, of, of a study. But it's an idea to analy analyze the data about uh, alcohol, uh, uh, alcoholic beverage with and without uh, ethanol. It's very interesting. Because when you give to the pigs, well, uh, the, the, the beer, um, the amount in alcoholic, well, uh, sorry, the amount was the same for the alcoholic and non-alcoholic beer. You give, for example, one unit or two units. What we chose is to, in, in the alcohol beer, the regular beer, we gave two dosages, the, lo the low and moderate, one can or two cans. Okay, we did whatever you can have. In the uh, non-alcoholic, we use only the two cans the, because we already uh, were investigating the low dose and moderate dose. So we use the two can. So the same amount of uh, of beer was used. But probably the amount of polyphenols was not the same. No, because um, it was uh, probably in the process of removing the alcohol from beer. Uh, some uh, of the polyphenols are yes, lost. It's a little bit. Exactly. So this is, uh, we knew that, but we w decided to use whatever is taken. Okay, in, uh, in in the car. regular. So yeah. even I, the, the beer was given to us by the uh, cerveceros of Spain. Yeah. So, so in a way, uh, this question was asked, and uh, the idea was, well, it's better to use a can that can be uh, bought in the, yes. in the shop and a compare. So that's what I'm saying is the first initiate, uh, initiatives that we have had, <coughs> but probably we should analyze what is in what we were given by one of the catechins or one of measurement. What we have done with you indeed is the uh, Chantofumol uh, measurements in, in, in urine, and I didn't present that data. And we didn't have a, do have a dose effect. We didn't find that. But we found that the animals that had had the, the beer had uh, the uh, isochantofumol in the in the urine. This mm -hmm. is the only thing we have done to analyze the content on polyphenols, but we haven't. But because this is a commercial beer that we have used, we can measure any time, yeah, whatever sure. we were given. And, and I must say that regarding your question on a stroke, the model we used was a model of ischemia. It doesn't matter if it's a heart, you know. So we wanted to use a model that was all the variables were very well taken into account. But we believe that our data can be extrapolated to any episodes of ischemia, peripheral vascular disease, and also ischemic stroke. And I think what we have measured is that what beer produces is a prevention against an, an injury that is going to be produced by ischemia when you take it before. We haven't done, for example, the contrary, to produce an infarction or an ischemia and then give the beer. We haven't done that. So the model is very clear. It's we wanted to test the option of a person having beer, a moderate amount of beer, having an insult, an ischemic insult anywhere in the body. The heart was our model. And then analyzing what was the outcome. So in a way, I think the, the, the data with the stroke, I mean, meaning uh, ischemic uh, damage to the, to the brain arteries, is conceivable because it's the same type of injury. And I guess the same will be for peripheral vascular disease in the leg. So in a way, what this, what this telling us is that the beer protects by alcohol and by non-alcohol products in th these different episodes that can happen. Yes. So, and there are different, but we are starting to know which ones are associated to alcohol and non-alcohol. And we also know that the alcohol, then the uptake in the gut is improved compared to the non-alcoholic beer. And therefore, the effects in alcoholic beer would be even higher than in non-alcoholic beer. And also, the metabolism in the liver is uh, decreased if you use alcoholic beer. And therefore, uh, alcoholic 
be a, would be even better. And uh, therefore, if you do the studies within animals, I think it's more promising to use alcoholic beer than non-alcoholic beer because drinking one to 1.5 liters per day wasn't fun after two weeks and uh, it was pretty hard to convince them to drink it. And uh, I think if you have a look, it's only 330 milligrams per liter polyphenols within the non-alcoholic beer. So you have to drink twice as much of amount to get the same amount of polyphenols. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, very good presentations. I have a question um, concerning uh, the, the pigs, the swine, and the marathon runners alike. Because I, I think if we think about polyphenols, we heard also this morning that uh, I think the gut microbiota are involved to some extent because that they will produce somehow the metabolites which we are able to absorb. We are not able to absorb the native polyphenols. So actually a question to both of you. To what extent are you pursuing this in the near future or do you have already data now uh, on these type of studies you presented today? I think this is also one topic of David Neiman. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a paper in PLOS and uh, they also examined the metabolism within the gut mm -hmm. and also the uptake and there's also a difference between responders and non-responders but exactly. uh, therefore we also had to have a, a big number 277 of marathon runners so that we can expect also the results because that's the law of the big number that uh, when you use so much then you see normally an effect. Oh, interesting to see. Yeah. Well, this is a very good question indeed. And I think that it could be considered that the, uh, the flora that is in the pig can be different from human. Mm -hmm. And we haven't tested that. But that's why we're measuring the urine is so sancho tumol, is, is so shanto humol. And to really identify that the metabolite that is found in humans is found in the pig. Mm -hmm. So on that side, mm, we were safe. Okay. But it's true that mm, we have to investigate more in uh, in the in what's happening at the intestinal level i mean you ca you have to consider that even between humans there are differences very huge differences yeah. yes. i mean yes. in I uh, when you take statins or mm -hmm. you uh, cholesterol yeah. there's big differences between humans mm -hmm. so yeah. probably there are differences that we have to really find yes. out in the and future. you used sister or brother swine so yes so we use the same yes. the same breed everything and maybe the, the same, same food already so the, the, the microflora should look a little the bit same. the same probably. so uh, we were uh, content with the results because we were analyzing all variables. But nevertheless, we wanted to measure urine levels to really understand that. So I think that um, in humans, uh, the flora will be, well, as you are aware, you now the metagenomics is very fashionable and we are investigating how this affects um, diabetes and everything. But yet there are general mechanisms that are uh, important and we can see it without knowing yet the flora of each one of us here. <laughs> well, uh, Jose Antonio Garcia Bonaire, I'm a nephrologist in, in Madrid, in Spain. Uh, congratulations. I, it's a question for any of you. Uh, we have uh, recently reviewed the effects of the moderate consumption of beer among hypertensive population. And our conclusion is that the moderate consumption is, is properly for, for them who are used to have uh, a, a moderate consumption of beer. Uh, I, my question is, to my knowledge, there are no studies uh, in target organ damage mm, prior to the stroke or myocardial infarction and so. Uh, do you know if it, is there any study um, relating a moderate consumption of beer and, mm, for example, microalbuminuria or carotid uh, intima thickness or any prior to the development of a uh, clinical disease? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, mm, I collected the only study that uh, uh, discussed uh, the relationship between alcohol and, uh, and uh, cardiovascular uh, events. Uh, and uh, I haven't uh, investigated this, uh, this uh, other endpoint, this uh, preclinical uh, data. Mm, I have uh, mm, data um, 
on uh, a cross-section study that uh, low moderate alcohol consumption in, uh, in uh, Italia co Italian court uh, is uh, associated with uh, a, a, a lower levels of uh, blood pressures. Uh, uh, we have also uh, follow-up data on heart failure uh, or alcohol consumption. We haven't uh, uh, published this data because uh, just now I have finished the validation of the events. And uh, we found that uh, a low intake of alcohol, not beer, because uh, in, in this uh, little region of Italian, beer is, uh, mm, is not uh, very dr uh, drink. And uh, we found a protection of alcohol consumption and heart failure, but not for uh, atrial fibrillation. We have all of this data that uh, we are analyzing in this uh, period. Okay. Okay. Is the question no? Okay. Thank you very much for the so spectacular session. <laughs> and now I will ask uh, Professor Franz Koch to come here and, and to, to, to conduct the, the award ceremony. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, Sharon.